This lecture is on cameras. First, what is a camera? A camera is a light tight box with a hole on one side that projects an image of what is outside, upside down and backwards, on a surface. Much If you put a piece of tracing paper or paper on the back side of a box with a hole on one side, the what is outside will be projected on a piece of tracing paper. That piece of tracing paper could be a CCD or a piece of film. This works best on a bright sunny day, and you will see what is outside projected upside down and backwards on that piece of paper. This is an illustration showing what I was just describing in words. This, is, this illustration was made in 1821. At this point in time, the artists of the day were using this camera obscura to make drawings for the paintings that they would make back in their studio. A camera and a and the human eye operate exactly the same. Light comes in through the lens of the camera and is projected upside down and backwards on the back side of that. The same th thing happens inside of the human eye. The image is projected onto the optic nerve inside of your eye, upside down and backwards. Your brain processes this information and tr makes it right side up and correct left to right so we can see what's going on. These are, some, these are some examples, early examples of illustrations that artists would have made in the early days as shown in the picture shown about the camera obscura. The artists of the day were having a tremendous problem dealing with what was called a vanishing point. They had a hard time figuring out how the things, the objects in the foreground and the background work together and how they decreased in size as they went off onto the horizon. Joseph Nipsey was the first person who experimented and produced a, a permanent image. He had a terrible time figuring out how to make this permanent. He got a piece of pewter. He, he, he coated a sheet of pewter with a mixture of bitumen dissolved in lavender oil. He exposed this in this light tight box, camera obscura, where the light struck it most intensely, the uh, combination of the bitumen and lavender oil became harder, and the areas where it was not struck so much, they were soft. He figured out how to put this down into a solution of the lavender oil that would dissolve away the soft parts and leave the hard parts to make this first image. This is the example of this image. You'll notice that this image that was made in 1826, both sides of this image are lit evenly. That's because this image took eight hours to create. This material was not light sensitive at all, or very minimally light sensitive. Then we moved on to daguerreotypes. They used a polished piece of uh, copper that they would coat with silver oxide. You would make the exposures using sunlight or northern light, and uh, the people would sit in front of the camera, same camera, and it, what way they would do is where the light had struck the um, silver oxide on the copper plate, it was more sensitive, and the mercury fumes would attach themselves to the harder or more exposed areas so that they could get an exposure. But the downside of this were the technicians and the people who were processing these images were inhaling the mercury fumes and it caused them to go mad because the mercury fumes were toxic to them. This is an example of a portrait of Abraham Lincoln at age 37 using the daguerreotype process. Here are some examples of pinhole cameras. They come in all sizes, shapes, and colors. You're limited only by your imagination. You can make them as big as you want or as small as you want. You can see that up on the upper left-hand side, there's a box with a multiple circles of, ho of holes. There's a, a large box. The bigger the box, the bigger the image. 
it's limited only by the size of the exposure material as to what you're going to get. Here are some examples of what you can create using a pinhole camera. They are beautiful. They still work. I made these images. I, when I was in school, I created what was called a Corso Flex. Here they say you should use sheets of copper. Well, I was too cheap. I wasn't going to go to an art store and buy a piece of copper. I had a Coors beer can that I used that I got a needle away from my wife. She, she likes to do uh, embroidery. And so I punched a hole in the cop, the aluminum beer can and to create a lens and then put it in a box and had it project an image on the opposite side. But I was a little bit more creative. I used a Quaker Oats box, which is a circular tube, so that the image what that was projected on this was curved, so it was distorted. I had a lot of fun with this. It worked very well, and I had, had a good time. Here are some other examples of using a pinhole camera. The one on the upper left is a very distorted image, a very wide angle, and then the one up in the upper right has flare. They're looking into the sunlight. The one on the lower left has multiple holes, so multiple images are cast onto the film or paper, whatever light, light sensitive material you use, and the lower right is just a very nice family portrait. In Belgium in 1843 and in Denmark in 1851, they started taking pictures of pickpockets and petty thieves to be able to identify them. The uh, images were not used as evidence, but they were helpful so that they could know who they were looking for and maybe uh, when a victim would come in, they would show them pictures of these people that they had, they had caught and arrested to see if they were the people that had victimized them. Here are examples of some of those photos. I think they are wonderful photos. They do a great job and do exactly what they were designed to do to identify these people. Even in 1890, the, the people that were making these photos became very creative and innovative and resourceful. They identified features as tattoos and missing fingers and other characteristics. They put a mirror up in the, the uh, above the right shoulder of the suspect and had, then had them put their hands up in front of them. And so they'd get an ID profile and their hands in one picture. This is what we call, and what I call now, a twofer. This is actually a threefer because they've got three images in and one capture, image capture. So this is a very good, useful thing to do and very innovative and creative. Alphonse Bertillon was 150 years ahead of his time. He had the idea and figured out that the characteristics of each person are individual and unique to that unique individual. He would measure different facial features and characteristics on all of the people. He would use cardboard forms to measure these. And he had 243 categories and 1,701 different separate groups. The problem was he didn't have computers to compile and search this information that he had collected so that they couldn't put it together to make it useful. Between that and the problem with the um, people doing the measurements, depending on if it was Monday morning and they were feeling good and showing up for work, how they measured people, or if it was Friday afternoon and they were tired and, and wanted to leave work, the consistency of the measurements was not good enough so that they could get consistent results. So Bertilli the Bertillian system wasn't accurate because they couldn't make good use of the information that they had collected. In 1903 at Fort Leavenworth Prison, they came up against a situation where they had two men that looked identical. There was William West and Will West. They could not tell the difference between these two men who were both in prison at the same time. They couldn't figure out how to tell them apart. 
and they figured out how to do this by using fingerprints because each of us have a unique set of fingerprints figured out which one was well west and which one was william west and got fingerprints so that they could identify who these men were and now 150 years later from bertillion now we're measuring all these different biometric feature facial features so that we can identify these individuals and it's working very well here they are they measure the width of your eyes pupil placement of your nose and the ears corners of your mouth all these features using very exact measurements so that they can identify and catalog all these things and they can search them now in today's world when they can do this and apply all this information so that they can find these people and identify them but this is the same thing happens here that happens with latent fingerprints you need you have what is a category usually somewhere between eight and ten because the features might match up but you need someone to actually look at the screen and see that they might show up the same on a screen numerically but the people are very different male or female uh, hispanic caucasian um, african-american native american fit the same characteristics and they are unique different individuals so you have to have some one sitting there looking at these individuals in the same way that they look at the fingerprints that come up when they send in a fingerprint for automated fingerprint identification this is a horrible picture of a jack the ripper victim in 1880. this is better than having a family member come into the morgue and and have to look at these people in the morgue in paris they did not have refrigeration then and these bodies were decomposing every day and they have lots of them so you have family members in that have to look at this loved one who has been murdered and then the, the other bodies that are there at the same time so it was much kinder and a better way to go to have these pictures and show the family and friends of this person and see if they could identify this victim the first photograph admitted as evidence was a land grant title it was this this was actually a photocopy a literally a photocopy of a piece of paper i found this by doing some a google search and found this this is the actual document that was photocopied and submitted and accepted as a piece of evidence in court the first photograph of an auto accident was accepted in the court in 1875 the situation was a the incident occurred when a buggy was out on a dirt road and tried to turn around in the dirt road and went off the road a little bit rode a little bit and the carriage tipped over on its side side and passengers in the carriage were injured i am still looking for this pictures of this incident and any other documentation and i have not been able to find it if you find it please let me know i would appreciate having a real world example of this comparison photographs in 1902 the first bullet comparison was entered into court the bullet was removed from a murder victim was carried compared to a bullet fired from a suspect rifle this is a photograph of a microscope microscopic comparison of the lands and grooves between two bullets showing that the lands and grooves match up and they were both shot through the same barrel of the same weapon these lands and grooves are produced by pushing what is called a mandrel a piece of metal with high areas and low areas then you force down the barrel of a weapon so that it causes the bullet to spin as it passes through the bolt through the barrel and that makes it fly truer and, and so that it hits what you send you what you're firing at here's a person doing a, a firing pin comparison 
when you pull down on the trigger, the firing pin strikes the primer at the back of the bullet, causes the powder in the bullet casing to burn. It pushes the bullet down the barrel of the gun and creates lands and grooves on the bullet as it goes through. But the firing pins also are unique and they create impressions on the back of the primer of each and every pistol bullet that they comes out of the pistol. Transparent roll film was invented in 1887 by the Reverend Heverett Hannibal Goodwin, but it wasn't granted a patent until 1898. George Eastman, a bank clerk in Rochester, New York, filed for a patent on flexible film in, in 1890 and started manufacturing cameras. Here is an example of his first camera. He got it screwed up here. This is 1889, and he sold the cameras for $100, for $25. It would allow the photographer to take 100 pictures on a single roll of film. But at $25, this was a very, very expensive camera. This, when a worker at, in the late 1800s was making a dollar a day, when he went to, to a bar and had, uh, he could get, have a nickel lunch, he'd get a, a, a mug of beer and a hard boiled egg for five cents. So this was not something that the common man could buy. When you, when the person who bought the $25 camera would shoot up all the pictures, they would send the exposed film off to, to Kodak in Rochester, New York. Then they would process and print the pictures and send them back to the photographer and give them a roll of film to put back into the camera. But this was not working very well because it was very expensive and there weren't very many people that were willing to pay the price. George Eastman got smart very quickly and figured out in 1889 that the money was in the processing and printing of the pictures, not the camera. So he did the, he sold the camera for with a roll of film in it for a dollar. And then he would ch charge them another dollar to process and print the film in the camera. And he was making a very tidy sum of money and allowing people to take pictures and had a much wider audience. Eastman Kodak made photography affordable to many more people. Kodak brought the ability to save your memories to the common man. Here are some examples of box cameras from the 18, from late 1800s, early 1900s. This is what they look like. This is an early detective camera. The only thing that makes this a detective camera is the title in the, the ad here to try to promote that it was special and did its job to take pictures. It's a camera. You know, the, the person who's taking the pictures might be a detective, but there's nothing special about this camera. Developments in police photography, 1902, we saw they were com comparing um, lands and grooves from firearms. And in 1907, they were taking pictures of all the people they were arresting for intoxication. In 1907, they had a speed detector camera. I have never seen or heard, I, I've heard about this in literature, but I've never seen one of these cameras. If you see one of these speed detector cameras, please let me know because I'd like to see it and include it in my research and get an example of it. 1930, they had sound movies so they could record confessions of suspects who had committed crimes. In 1931, they had x-ray images that they could use showing broken bones or looking inside of objects by using x-ray so they wouldn't have to break into them. And in 1934, they used ultraviolet radiation to make blood, bloody shoot prints visible. When you use ultraviolet over in a darkened room over a blood stain, the blood pattern would fluoresce. And if you can see it, 
you can record it. That's the basic rule of photography. If your eyes can see it, the camera can record it. So you use your ultraviolet radiation source over blood and it will fluoresce. This is a typical field photographer's camera kit from 1879 to 1930. This is an 8x10 view camera. If you wanted an 8x10 finished print, this is what you had to have because enlargers did not exist then. So if you wanted an 8x10 print, you had to have an 8x10 negative because all they could do was make contact prints of the same size as the, the original negative that you'd capture your image with. Here this person has a satchel. He's got film holders holding two film holders that allows him to take a total of four images, a tripod, and his 8x10 camera that he would use out in the field. This is a cutaway view of a camera, much like the camera obscura. You point the camera up to your object out in front of the, the camera. The light comes through the lens. It's projected upside down and backwards on a piece of ground glass or whatever you put there opposite the camera lens so that you can see what you're going to take a picture of. You adjust this to bring it into focus and then you make your exposure. This is the grandfather of all police cameras. This is a 4x5 press camera. It's a Graflex Crown Graphic. It is a wonderful camera. I used this a lot early in my career. Expensive equipment versus cheap equipment. Having an expensive camera does not make the pictures better. There are limits when you have inexpensive cameras. But if you're smart and you know how to use your inexpensive camera to the limits of its ability, it can do an excellent job as long as you don't ask it to do things that it can't do. Inexpensive cameras are limited. They will take bright and will take wonderful images of subjects out on a bright sunny day that are well lit. If you take the camera into a into inside environment, then you need extra light or you need to be able to adjust, adjust the sensitivity of the camera so that it can make pictures in these low light level situations. And if you're in something like a burned out house, then you need to be very careful and move up the sensitivity of your camera a lot so that you can be able to take these pictures. And trying to take pictures of accident scenes or crime scenes at night with an inexpensive camera, you are very limited because the adjustments and sensitivity of an inexpensive camera are very limited and not will not allow you to do a good job of documenting a scene. Typically, the lens on your inexpensive camera does not do a real good job of taking pictures of shoe prints, tire tracks, and other pieces of evidence for comparison. An inexpensive camera will not pr produce comparison quality images, typically admissibility of images. For Im images to be accepted as evidence in court, you have to have someone who was at the time, at the scene at the time, who will testify that these are fair and accurate images that describe the scene. That can be the, the photographer who captured the images, or a detective or some police officer who was there and saw you capture these images. Without someone to do that, these evidence, these images are not evidence. 35 millimeter film cameras are still out there. They are few and far between, but they exist and there are people who love them and still like film. Yes, you can buy film. Yes, today. Professional digital cameras run between six and eight thousand dollars. Unless you have a, a real special need, you don't need one of these cameras. These are two illustrations of a digital single lens reflex camera. The camera on the upper left shows light coming in through the lens, striking the mirror, and being redirected to a piece of ground glass. You put your eye up to the pinaprism and adjust the lens in and out so that the image is in focus. When it's in focus, you push down on the release, shutter release, the mirror comes up out of the way. You cannot see the image, 
but the light strikes the CCD or film or whatever other material you have there and you capture the image. On the lower right, this is just an illustration reinforcing that when the object in front of the lens comes through the lens, is projected upside down and backwards on the film or light sensitivity at light sensitive material at the back of the camera. Here's a exploded view of the typical digital camera today. Back in the good old days, it had levers and springs. Now it's all circuit boards. And these cameras do not take abuse well at all. These boards break and they are you know, just, you don't want to be dropping one of these. This again is a illustration showing the light path through a typical digital single lens reflex camera. The light comes through, the lens hits the mirror, the image is projected up to the ground glass. You move the lens element in and out by t twisting the lens and looking through the pentaprism to get the image in focus. You push down on the center release, the mirror moves out of the way, the image continues to the light sensitive material behind the mirror and you capture an image. These are the differences between a no mirror camera and a mirror camera. The camera on the left is 18 millimeters deep. This is a very skinny camera. There are 25.4 millimeters to an inch. So this is just about three quarters of an inch thick. And the camera on the right is like an inch and a half thick. The camera on the, on the left is lightweight and easy to use. The one on the right is what I've been describing where the light comes through the lens, projected up onto a piece of ground glass. You have a lot of moving parts in the, par the camera with the mirror. The one on the left, you don't have so many moving parts. Here, again, you've got the light coming through the lens on the far left striking the mirror, being re reflected up to the ground glass. You look through the viewfinder, you focus, and you capture your image. The one in the middle, the light comes through the lens, strikes the CCD or like the electronic. The, the light comes through and strikes the digital exposure medium, and is the image is sent up to the eyepiece and you focus your image. And the one on the far right, you see your image come through, or it comes through the light, strikes the, strikes the digital media, and you see the, what you're going to capture an image on the display on the back of the camera. A forensic photographer's camera must have manual mode because not all assignments happen on bright sunny days. Sometimes we have to be in situations on where they're up in a helicopter, you're in a burned out house, you're in down in a sewer. You might want to look at my Day in the Life series that I have created to show you illustrations of some of the different situations I've been and why you need to have a camera that has flexibility so you can use different lenses and lighting situations and be able to adjust your camera so that you can capture and describe and document these scenes. If you have questions, please ask.